are uh, known among, among other things as being the uh, uh, designer of these fabulous Barney's uh, windows. Talk a little bit about um, how one sort of uh, gets to be uh, a designer of Barney's windows. Where, where did that uh, a skill come from and, and what was your family uh, encouraging and nurturing of <laughs> no? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I grew up in this town called Reading, which is outside of London, and it was sort of very dismal. It's where Oscar Wilde was in jail, and there was like a biscuit factory and all these different factories. It was just dismal. And I thought, there has to be something more to life than this. So my early years in the 50s in London were very dismal. And then realizing I was gay and thinking, God, I'm going to end up in the prison like Oscar Wilde, because it's illegal, hello. So things weren't looking so great. And then my mom would say, oh, you can get a job at the biscuit factory or the metal box factory. Or, and I thought, oh, God, you've got to be joking. So um, I used to do freelance display jobs, because a lot of little stores in London, they, they didn't have a full-time display person, so I would do these freelance jobs. And they were fun, and it was extra cash. So there was this tailor shop on Savile Row, and I used to do the windows, and I would try and make them really demented and shocking, because I like to get attention. And um, I put these little stuffed rats in the window with little bow ties on, because it was for a tuxedo window. And this is the 70s, you know, so it was kind of proto-punk rock. And um, this guy came by, and he said, that's great. It's really fun, and you should come work for me in L.A. And so I just basically went home and packed and went to work in L.A. And <laughs> this guy paid me $100 a week to do his windows. So that's how I went to, got to America. And, but I didn't have a grand plan. It was all about, oh, well, that seems more better than that, you know. <laughs> and then um, I worked there for eight years. See, as a gay, you are this marginalized, freaky outsider. So as a little kid, you realize you're part of this reviled group of people um, that are basically discriminated against or were. I mean, when I was a teenager, to be gay, it was illegal. You could go to prison. To be gay um, was classified as a mental illness. So you were nuts as well. Um, so, you know, gay people, historically, and not very long ago. I mean, when I came to America, you didn't get your green card if you were gay. So they, they would ask you, are you homosexual or heterosexual? And you had to say, I'm heterosexual, which of course was, you know, tough. Um, when I, this is like late 70s. So I said, um, no, I like girls, don't I? You know, <laughs> as best I could. And the guy was like, I don't believe you. <laughs> But they can't prove it, so you had to deny it, which is an insane piece of discrimination. But that when it was like the eight, early 80s when that was overturned. So we gay men, we had to navigate that discrimination, learn to feel good about ourselves under those circumstances. And so we have this very idiosyncratic worldview. You know, we have this creative, quirky, eccentric, idiosyncratic way of seeing the world. That's why there's so many, you know, from Tchaikovsky to, you know, um, John Galliano to, to um, Albert Elbaz. They're, that's why there's so many gay men who are, who are super creative and have this bizarre, freaky take on things. When did you first move to uh, New York? Um, well, I was living in LA in the early 80s and a friend of mine said, you should come with me. We, I go volunteer every year at the Costume Institute, when Diana Vreeland is running it, and blah, blah, blah. And I know, of course, knew, of course, who Diana Vreeland was, and um, worshipped at the Vreeland Temple, because she was so amazing. And um, I said, but no, I don't volunteer. Homie, don't play that. I, <laughs> no. I need to be, I'm very experienced display professional. So somehow or other, I went with her, she got her volunteer job, and I talked my way into a paying job. I was display designer on costumes of Royal India, which was 1985 at the Metropolitan Museum. It was a fabulous show with all these bejeweled saris. And um, at the opening, 
which was not the big deal that it is now. You could buy like a ticket for a hundred bucks and, and go in and jiggle about on the Temple of Dendur. You know, it wasn't <laughs> like it is now where it's impossible uh -huh. to get in. So, um, and I met Gene Pressman, the owner of Barney's, and he said, oh, I know who you are. You do those cheeky windows at Maxfield in LA. And he said, I need somebody to do my windows. So. I thought, oh, that sounds better than, you know. So that my career has been really getting opportunities floating along and just mm. grabbing them. Otherwise, I'd still be there. I mean, I've been at Barney's for 27 years. Mm. So I just sort of sit there going like this, waiting for the next <laughs> thing and pounce. So I don't have a grand plan. Is there one that stands out for you that you're particularly proud of, a window that? When I moved to LA, there were, it was this weird period where there were these coyote, uh, people were, Coyotes were starting to come into Beverly Hills and Hollywood in the 70s. So there was some woman's child was abducted by a coyote. And I thought, God, that would make such a great window. <laughs> so I, in my naivety, depicted this abduction. Because, you know, you're, I was 25 and just sort of impulsive. So that window... Um, yeah, because in LA you can rent anything. So I went to the studio and I said, do you have any coyote stuffed coyotes? And they said, they're over there. And there were rows. They were like that one and one that had been hit by a car. And you could have your pick. Actually, I used the one that, I used the one that was like, like this, dragging a child mannequin along in its teeth. And then there was one one of the ones that had been hit by a car, I um, put on, like, leaping onto somebody <laughs> in the other window. Um, I, I want to mention before we, uh, we start to wrap things up that you recently went with uh, a Times reporter uh, and had a meal. <laughs> and you uh, basically broke foods, meals, or foods, I guess, down into gay food and straight food. Well, yeah. And Obviously, anyone can see that. I think a, a burrito is straight, but well, sushi is gay. You know, is that pe correct? People have been laboring under this silly idea that food is divisible into four groups, right? It's utter nonsense. Anyone can see that. It's, foods are either gay or they're straight. And the key to a healthy diet and the key to saying slim and trim is to actually not eat gay foods. The food is, the key is to have a balance. So, um, and I give the example of like, if you order a big steak, right, which is obviously straight, hello, <laughs> um, then, uh, and you order the mashed potatoes that go to go with it, that's two straight foods together. There's too much heterosexuality on your plate. So you're better to have a fluffy green salad with your steak. And so I, I give other examples, like um, Japanese food is very gay. Mm. You know, obviously you're taking big sloppy bits of fish and making them into little tiny bonbons, <laughs> which is clearly a very clearly. gay thing to be doing. Clearly. And then Mexican food, is wildly straight. I mean, a, a burrito is basically a combination of a penis and a turd. So <laughs> it's very important that once in a while you have like a fluffy tostada <laughs> with that. And um, my niece actually um, just went off to Latin America. And um, I, I said to her, when you get kidnapped, Tell your kidnappers, beg them not to give you any guacamole because no. you'll be in a confined space and you'll eat too much and it'll just be a disaster. <laughs> so, um, but it's about balancing. Like if you lived on gay food, like if you ate ladere macaroons all day long, mm. you would have some kind of gay explosion of diabetes. <laughs> right, but it's right. about So it's about balancing gay and straight food, which I think is always seem very self-evident to me, but people seem quite surprised by my food theories. Yeah.